Hello and welcome to the third video in our series on the caching advanced model. This is going to be the first of two videos discussing the equilibrium of the model. In this first video, we're going to define the equilibrium and figure out how we're going to go about solving the problem of the consumer. And then in the second video, we're going to see how to define the equilibrium solution and how to find the value of all the variables. So let's get into it. The first is the equilibrium definition. And this one I wrote in full, and it's going to take some time because it's a bit worthy, but I think it's worthwhile going through it. An equilibrium is now a sequence of real quantities. So it's a sequence because we need all the variables in all the periods. And our real quantities are the consumption of the consumers, the labor supply of the consumers, labor demand by the firms, real bonds, taxes, real demand for money, real value of nominal bonds and profits. Then we have some prices, which of course are taken as, as given by the consumers. PT, the price of consumption goods, QT and ST, the price of bonds, and WT, the real wage. And these sequences of quantities and prices have to be such that markets are going to be clearing and optimality satisfied while well, taking as given the government's monetary rule, so that's going to be alpha, and the productivity for every period, that's going to be ZT. And so what are the conditions that have to be satisfied? Well, firms have to maximize their profits, choosing labor demand, taking prices as given, as well as productivity. And as we saw, that value for profits, it's going to be given by this max, and it's going to depend on the labor demand given some prices. So as we mentioned before, if wages are lower than productivity, they want infinitely many uh, uh, workers. And so that means also infinite profit, so on and so forth. So we've discussed this already. Then the next thing is we have our consumers. They maximize the present value of utility. They are going to choose consumption and labor. They also have to choose their assets, real bonds, nominal bonds, and money. And they're going to be subject to a series of budget and cash in advance constraints. And they're going to take as given prices and transfers. And so their problem is to choose all those variables to maximize the present discounted value of utility subject to the sequence of these constraints. So they don't have two constraints. And this is important for us to understand going forward. They actually have two constraints for every period. There are infinitely many periods, so they have infinitely many constraints. But in any given period, they have only two. Okay, then the government is going to choose the transfers to balance the budget taken as given the growth rate of money or equivalently the monetary rule. And we've seen this, there is a typo here because it requires a, a minus. So I apologize for that. There is a typo and this should be minus PT. Okay, then, oh, sorry. Then finally, markets have to clear. And we have three markets to clear. We have the labor market, we have the money market, Clearing the money market, why is this equal to 1? Well, remember that MT is the ratio of the money demand of consumers relative to the money supply from the government. Well, for this to clear, those two have to be equal, and so little MT has to be equal to 1. So MT equal 1 is the same as money market clearing. And then bonds have to be all equal to 0, both nominal and real bonds. Why? Are they equal to zero? That's what we call a no trade equilibrium. You've seen this already in chapter seven when you took intermediate macro one last semester. Well, the reason is there is a single representative agent. And so if all the agents are the same, or equivalently, if there is a single agent, who are they gonna trade with? Remember, the government in this example, the government in this model doesn't have any debt. And so in order for somebody to buy a bond, somebody else has to sell that bond. Because there is only somebody one there, there is only one person here or one representative agent, then uh, the only solution is for them not to trade. There is a missing market here. The missing market is the goods market. The goods market clearing condition is that consumption has to be equal to total output. Those are the real goods, but we don't have to include it explicitly because of Balras's law. If we explicitly incorporate all the markets but one, that last market is going to be satisfied. We briefly mentioned this in our previous module when we were discussing the bond market clearing condition. 
So now we have our equilibrium definition and we can go and figure out some of the properties of this equilibrium. Uh, the first one is the labor market. And this we've seen before in class. So we know that the demand is perfectly elastic at WT equals ZT. And so that means that WT equals ZT is actually the only possible equilibrium. At any other wage, demand will be infinity or zero, and it wouldn't possibly match labor supply. So now we know what wages have to be. Now, since we know wages, this solves for the equilibrium in the labor market in terms of the price. We still don't know the quantities. That's we're gonna. That's gonna be actually the last thing we find. But we've solved for the problem of finding the equilibrium price of this market. It also solves for profits, which we now know are equal are equal to zero in equilibrium. So now that we've solved the labor market, we can uh, start discussing the consumer's problem. And so the consumer's problem here. The same we had before, we have the sum of discounted utilities. We want to maximize that subject to a sequence of budget and cash in advance constraint. How to solve this? We have a problem because we have infinitely many periods, but that's actually not that different from what we've done before. The key is that it looks exactly like problems we've done before, but just with more constraints. And so we can use the same Lagrangian method that we had we just need to add a multiplier for every constraint in every period. So because we have a budget and a cash in advance constraint in every period, what we're going to have is mu t is going to be the multiplier of the period t budget. And lambda t will be the multiplier of the period t cash in advance constraint. This is the same as problems we've done before, just that now we have a multiplier for every period. Now, this multiplier of course, measure the utility value of resources in each period. But because there are multiple periods and utility in the future is not the same as utility today, we have to discount the multipliers with beta, the same that we discount utility here in the objective function. So in this next slide, we can see how the Lagrangian looks like. We have our objective function plus the sum from t equals zero to infinity of all the cash in advance constraints. So the cash in advance constraints are multiplied by lambda. And remember, because lambda is measuring utils, we need to discount those utils to present value. So that's what the beta is doing there. And here we have the difference between the cash on hand and the expenditures. So that these parentheses is always positive or zero. Because you can have expenditures lower than your cash on hand but not the other way around. And then the other sum, it's going to have mu, that's the multiplier on the budget constraint, and we have all the budget constraints. That's, that's why we have this sum. We have total income and expenditure plus savings. So this one also includes the savings in cash. So now we have the Lagrangian. Before we go ahead and just take derivatives with everything, let's think what is the consumer choosing in a given period t? Well, for sure it's choosing how much to consume and how much to work. But then the other things that the consumer is choosing is how much to accumulate of every type of asset. How much bt plus one to have, xt plus one to have, and mt plus one to have. And this is important to realize what the consumer is choosing today is the assets that they're gonna save today that pay tomorrow. What about the value of current assets, BT, XT, and MT? Well, if you're already in period T, the value of those assets is already predetermined by previous actions. The decision in time T is all about accumulating for the future. That's the dynamic version. So we don't need to worry about the value of BT, XT, and MT because that's going to be determined by other choices. We're going to focus on the choices in period T. And here you can see the first order conditions. I'm not going to stop here too long because I actually want to show you the next slide where I have those same conditions. I'm just writing all of them as marginal benefit in the left-hand side equals marginal cost in the right-hand side. And one thing you should do is take each of these equations and interpret what they mean. 
going to give you some pointers for that. In order to interpret them, you have to be very much aware of what is mu t and what is lambda t. So the value of more resources in your budget constraint at time t, that's going to be mu. Just the value of having more resources, more total income. Lambda t is the value of having more cash in hand. So these two are slightly different values. But interestingly enough, the term mu t plus lambda t shows up a lot. That's because when you accumulate a liquid assets, money or bonds, you get resources tomorrow. That's mu t, right? You get more income tomorrow. But those resources are liquid, so you can also convert them into cash. And so they have the double value of both giving you more income and relaxing your cash in advance constraint because they also give you cash. So all of these different assets, they give a value lambda t plus 1, mu t plus 1. But because this value is going to be obtained in the future, it ends up being discounted with beta. So that's just taking into account that you're going to get the value of holding those assets tomorrow. So when you accumulate an asset, you have to pay for it now because the cash in advance constraint tells you that in order to pay for things, you need liquid assets. You need that the cost reflects that when you are accumulating something and you're making an expenditure, then both the cost in terms of lower resources and the cost in terms of lower assets shows up. Let me go back for a moment. This is what I mean. Take, for example, real bonds. You're going to have lambda t plus mu t showing up in the cost, lambda t plus 1, mu t plus 1 times beta showing up in the benefits. That's because if you're going to get more of these bonds, well, they're going to cost you resources. Each of these bonds costs pt times st uh, real resources today. And the value of spending those resources is giving up some of the resources in your budget and in your cash in advance, because this is expenditure you have to finance with cash. And so you get lambda t plus mu t. But tomorrow, this is going to pay off, and it's going to pay off pt plus 1. This additional real bond is going to pay you pt plus 1 in terms of these real values. And you're going to value that with the lambda t and the mu t, because this payment you're going to get is both good for the cash in advance constraint and for the budget constraint. So it's relaxing both constraints. That's why both multipliers show up. That's kind of different to what happens with labor. The cost of labor is, of course, in terms of this utility, but the benefit of labor only shows up in the budget constraint because you get paid after you've made all your other expenditures. So this one only has a mu t. So that's important for you to, to, to know, and that's what I'm saying in this last line. Finally, we should be thinking about how to get the money growth rate into this interpretation. Well, if you notice, alpha is going to show up in the first three conditions of mt and bt plus 1. These are both nominal variables. And not only that, it's showing up on the cost side. So how should we think about that? Well, we're still not sure. We're going to figure it out for sure. But like right now, we don't know. But here is some intuition. But Higher growth rate of money will for sure affect the inflation rate. We don't know exactly how, but it will have an effect on the inflation rate. If there is inflation, then our nominal assets will be worth less tomorrow. And that is a cost when thinking about buying them. Because in order to get the same payoff in the future, you need to accumulate more assets the more inflation there is. That's the same thing as saying they are worth less tomorrow that in order to get the same value, you need to accumulate more of them. So it's more costly to get the same value tomorrow. And that is why the alpha is showing up there. So in the next video, we're going to take all of these conditions and we're going to figure out how to solve for the equilibrium values. I'll see you then.